if you just live in this space of I can be anything, it's true, but ultimately you will be nothing when our time runs out. I think many of us live out lives this way, even though unconsciously, like, ah, I've tried this six, seven, eight times. I must not be worthy of that. I can't do that. <laughs> done some ultra marathons and I've done a lot of races and difficult things and ice baths and you name it, I've probably done it. And after a while, I'm like fighting against some of these things. If you're denying discomfort in any situation or in any sort, you're ultimately denying a piece of yourself. And when you truly surrender, you're free of the discomfort. Ultimately, the question for me is, you know, Sterling, what do you want your life to be about? Before we get into hunting discomfort, let's take a step yeah. back. Just embracing it is hard enough. Why have you and how have you learned that it's not enough just to push away the discomfort? It's not enough just to embrace the discomfort, but you actually have to actively seek it. Why is yeah. discomfort so important? Yeah. Well, you know, I think the biggest thing that people tell me as I'm out there talking about hunting discomfort is they're like, Sterling, you don't know what I'm dealing with. Right. I've got this relationship problem, this money problem, this work problem. I have got enough discomfort. I don't need to find any more. And my answer is inevitably always the same. It's, oh, you mean you're living with discomfort. You're not hunting it. Right. And, and that's the big differentiator here. Right. Like we're so used to living with these things that we don't want in our life or we're not comfortable with or we're not happy about. We start to placate them away and then we're surrounded by discomfort wondering, hey, how do I get out of this? How did I get stuck? And yeah. it's simply because you haven't hunted it. Okay, so we've hit on something right away in, in your book. I thought we were going to. Yeah, I know. I mean, it was going to happen eventually, right? <laughs> yeah. So we hit on something right away and, and I'm trying to wrap my mind around this. So yeah. I'm like your audience. I'm like everyone watching this. Uh, like right now, I'm training for Spartan. Saturday, nice. I I'm want running. to do one of those myself, by the way. <laughs> Saturday, I'm running my first Spartan race. Nice. And the training is aggressive. It's hardcore. It's super hard. It's super uncomfortable. That's great. Yeah. But I'm like probably about 15 pounds heavier than I should be for this race. Yeah. And I've known about the race since January. Um, since January, I've put on something like six pounds of muscle mass, which is pretty cool. But I've also That's put good. on like eight pounds of non-muscle mass or whatever it is. Yeah. Like the other thing, the fat. Uh, and so I'm like heavier than I want to be. Uh, I don't feel good. I don't look at the way that I want to look. And so I'm thinking about, I don't know, man, I saw your Instagram. You're, you're doing well. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. Last year I was doing well. I'm much heavier now, uh, okay. but, but you know, I was thinking about you on Monday hunting discomfort and I was feeling terrible and I gave myself a pass. Like I ate the stuff I shouldn't eat. Yeah. Um, I gave into it and I'm just like, <sighs> and so this is the thing that I can't wrap my mind around. We are all uncomfortable. Yeah. But but it's the wrong type of discomfort. Like it's the it's the discomfort we didn't choose or it's what we just chose to live with. Or help me understand why if we don't hunt the discomfort, it's gonna come knocking on our door anyway. Uh, I, well, I would say it's the discomfort that you haven't surrendered to. Uh, you know, it's it's the last part of the book, and I think it's the most important part. Like it's one thing to be uncomfortable or to commit to things that you're not quite sure how you're going to achieve, or say, "Hey, I'm going to do the Spartan race in six months, right? I'm going to do it no matter what." But it's something else entirely to open yourself and open your heart to that discomfort, to let it pass through you. And when you truly surrender, you're free of the discomfort. Right. I, I would say with some of the things you talk about with eating, it's so relatable, right? Like I've done the same thing. I think everybody is like, eh, I'm going to skip my diet today. I'm going to have the candy bar, whatever it is, you know? For me, eating, it's, uh, it's, it's peanut butter, yogurt, granola wraps. <laughs> all right. Okay. <laughs> aggressive. I mean, I it, it, sounds, it sounds good. I think I might have to try one of these. It sounds very fitness oriented, by the way, too. So you can't be too far off the mark. It's not like I'm going to Kentucky Fried Chicken, right? But it's uh, it's really opening yourself to that discomfort in that moment, like in that moment where you're like, hey, I want to go off my diet or I don't want to do what I said I was going to do. That's your moment, your access to surrender to the discomfort, to let go of whatever it is that's gripped you, because simply by having the snack or having the tree or going off your diet, you know, however you want to phrase it, well, you're succumbing to the discomfort and you're actually placating it. And it right. will therefore stay with you. Does okay, that make so, sense? It, it does in my head. I'm not sure if I still get so like 
let's, let's break it down. Like I, I yeah. let's say, let's say I don't want to go to the gym and work out today cause I'm super sore or my right. alarm goes off at four 30 in the morning. <laughs> Honestly, an extra two <laughs> or three hours of sleep sounds amazing. Yeah. Uh, you know, or breaking my diet or, um, yeah, not wanting to lift as heavy as I want to lift, not yeah. wanting to have the conversation with my team member that I have yeah. to have. Mm -hmm. Not wanting to invest the dollars to hire this person because I'm so uncertain if it'll work out or not, or sure. that marketing thing. Like I face this in every area, which is which is why we do hard things. I have right. to tell myself that. But <laughs> there's a problem, obviously, with it. But what's the problem with just giving in? Well, what do you mean giving in? Like giving in is different than surrendering. Giving yeah, in is when you're kind of surrender to the discomfort. I don't know what that that's means. That's right. Yeah. Well, when I talk about surrender, there's two components of it. The first is maybe obvious. Like if you want to achieve a goal, you have to surrender the time, the resources, the money, uh, whatever it is to achieve that. I think everybody would say, oh yeah, but obviously if I want to achieve X goal, I need to put X, Y into it. Right. Okay. The second part of it is actually more important, which is to surrender your resistance to doing that thing. Um, Carl Jung, I don't know if you uh, follow any of his work, you know, psychologist, I'm a big fan. His work is the foundation of Myers-Briggs, which many of us has taken, you know, helping us understand our personalities a little bit better. And what he says is that, uh, we cannot change anything until we accept it. Mm. Condemnation doesn't liberate, it oppresses. And so as you get stuck in not wanting things, wishing things were a different way, uh, pushing against something, you're automatically kind of uh, stuck in a box. And to free yourself from that box, you have to open yourself to it. Good. That makes sense. And in your dedication to the book, I, I always look at people's after notes and, yeah, and their yeah. thank yous because there's, yeah. so, there's so much hidden there. Yeah. But your, your dedication caught something in me, which is that this is dedicated to all those who are courageous enough to step out of their head and into their heart. Yeah. What you just said reminded me of that. Um, because I think that we can spend a lot of time overthinking things or, or giving in or what have you, but, yeah. but the, the idea of just like, just accepting, I feel like garbage right now. Cause my alarm's going off and I only got five hours sleep or whatever, but I just have to get up like just yeah. accepting what is. Yeah. And really feeling it, I, I think is important, right? Like it's easy enough to say, ah, I don't want to feel crappy or I don't want to feel like garbage or I don't want to feel angry even, but it's exactly those feelings that you need to let move through you so you can be free of them. Uh, one of my favorite parts of the book, and it, it's been with me for a long time is if you're denying discomfort in any situation or in any sort, you're ultimately denying a piece of yourself. And if you're denying a piece of yourself, don't wonder why you can't reach your full potential. It's because you're not using all of yourself to arrive wherever it is that you're trying to go. And how, I have to tell you, you by the you way, learn that. How yeah. did you learn that? If that's been with you for so long, um, it's a good question. I think it's one of the things that just slowly landed on me. You know, I've done some ultra marathons and I've done a lot of races and difficult things and ice baths and you name it. I've probably done it. And after a while, I'm like, you know what? I'm fighting against some of these things. Like there's a piece of me that I don't want to let through. A good example of that is I went skydiving a couple of years ago with my sister. My sister, by the way, we work together. She does all my back office stuff, all the marketing, all the operations. I wouldn't be doing it without her. And she goes, Sterling, it's my birthday. I want to go skydiving and you have to go because you're the no matter what guy. And I'm like, man. <laughs> I don't know if I want to do that. Yeah, I was uncomfortable, right? And you go and it actually gets worse. Have you been skydiving before? I, I've not, but I, I know where the story's going. Well, you have to sign like 30 <laughs> release forms saying that you're doing it on your own accord. And basically, if you die, it's not their fault. Right. And we get up in that plane and I am terrified. Like absolutely terrified, like almost so much. So I can't talk. And yeah, like many, I think Will Smith has got a great story about skydiving. Once you leave the plane, it's incredibly freeing. But as I was getting up there, I'm like, you know what? I don't want to show all these other people in the plane that I'm scared. 
Like I'm holding that discomfort inside of me because, you know, I think they're going to judge me or I'm trying to be brave or whatever it is. They're not and paying attention. That, they're, they're freaking out themselves. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, many of them, I'm sure. About how scared you are. <laughs> Some of these instructors though are insane. They're doing cannonballs backwards. They've done like thousands of jumps. I'm like, clearly they've hunted this discomfort. They've let go of it. But for me, this is the first time doing it. And, you know, it's, it's that thing. I think that was one of the moments where I started to realize hang on, I'm denying something that's part of me that's just as valid as the good times. And if I'm going to deny the negative emotions, I'm also somewhat limiting my positive ones. And as you can kind of accept all of them, not only is it hugely freeing, but that's where all the results in life are. That's amazing. Now, what I love uh, about the way that you approach this idea of hunting discomfort is you break down discomfort into a bunch of different areas. I think, yeah, uh, and, and you know, as the host of We Do Hard Things, I see doing hard things as taking courageous moves, being totally. bold, having hard conversations, yeah. making really challenging financial decisions. And then I bump into other people who think doing hard things is like becoming David Goggins. Or, and, and, it, and it is, it is, but it's also other things. It's, it's being, right. the hardest thing is probably to be true to you all yeah. the time, right? Like that's so hard. You break yeah. down discomfort into a bunch of different camps or a bunch of different areas that I love. Uh, yeah. Walk us through what those are if you can. Well, well, first let me just say, cause I, I think this is an important kind of foundational piece is it is very different for everybody. And on the scale of emotions, we all have the same set of emotions. We're all human. And in some sense, like you can't be more sad than sad. <laughs> and whether you attribute that to something awful that happened in your life, you lost your job or you broke up with your girlfriend, whatever it is, your pinnacle of sad is your pinnacle of sad. And you can't diminish somebody's um, feeling of sadness because the circumstances are separate. It's that person's experience that matters. It's our experience of sadness or fear or uh, whatever it is that really counts. Now, the other thing I want to say before we dive into like the kinds of discomfort is that uh, I found some really cool research as part of doing this book. I spent probably a thousand hours looking at different articles in psychology and brain science and you name it, I was probably diving into it. And I found some research in the University of Michigan. And I don't know if you recall this from reading the book, but they did a, a brain study. They were doing brain scans on people to analyze discomfort. And they were looking at specifically physical discomfort, like you break a leg or emotional discomfort, like uh, you lose your job. And they did brain scans of people that were going through these different kinds of discomfort. And what they found was mind blowing to me. It didn't matter what kind of discomfort that person was experiencing, physical, mental, emotional, the brain and body processed it almost identically. Like the body doesn't know the difference so much. So, by the way, if you're having a tough emotional time, if you take Tylenol, it'll make you feel better. Yeah. Like that's how close the body processes those things. And it's like you can take one step further from that and say, wait a minute, where I meet discomfort anywhere grows my ability to handle it everywhere. Right. It's a muscle you can build. Everybody knows you want to build your biceps. Well, we better see in the gym doing some curls, right? You want to do the Spartan race. I don't know. You better be doing some rocking or something, it's, right? No, it's Grip all exercises, grip strength, man. There's no so kidding. much, so much hanging, so much bar work. Oh, uh, it's all grip. Okay. So, so we're clear. If you want to do Spartan, you got to do grip work. <laughs> if you want a capacity to deal with discomfort, if you want a capacity to grow, well, you better be seeking out discomfort and surrendering to it. I love this quote from my mom. She said, it's Robert Frost, but to me, it'll always be my mom. Uh, she said, uh, the way out is through. And the way out is through, but it's through surrender. And as we can get to that, it opens up so many possibilities in life and business. It's unreal. So th is, that might've been a little a, bit of a tangent. But. No, that's cool though. Cause this is where we're going with it, but it's almost like a paradox, I suppose, right? Like to, to leave, uh, to surrender is to yeah. give up control of something. That's right. But by doing so, you actually, what, put yourself in a position where you can just accept what is, you can deal with reality that is truth as opposed to fictitious, fake, fantasy, hopes, dreams, wishes, or what have you, all of this stuff that isn't grounded in it. Like, mm. gosh, that's, that's uncomfortable, isn't it? 
Well, it is. And, and I would say it's not even giving up control. It just feels like giving up control. Uh-huh. I think when you surrender, what you're doing is giving control to your subconscious or your greater self. Um, your conscious mind is very, very limited. I mean, the amount of brain processing power that we all have at a conscious level, uh, you know, here's some other like brain science for you. I'm going to get the zeros wrong, but it's yeah, something yeah, like I, where, that I have it here. It, <laughs> the the it, point zero, 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 two, I think you said or something. Yeah, like. I think there's like seven zeros and four or 5% <laughs> conscious. So, you know, the vast majority of what's happening in our head is subconscious, even though we all walk around every day figuring like, ah, I kind of know what's going on in my head. I know what's going on in the world. The reality is you are not even close. You know, you could look at a room, you've got a whole room available to you. And all you're looking at is like a, a something the size of a, a pinprick. It's literally nothing. And when you surrender, you give up control or perceivably give up that control. What you're doing is you're surrendering to that subconscious, something greater in you. You could even say your greater potential. And it's that potential that's going to come through. That's how you reach greater potential. Ah. Okay, I want to dig into the first part of your book because, yeah. because again, you know, hunting physical discomfort. We, yeah. We've been talking about Spartan a bit. I mean, yeah. last night I'm doing these wall sits that my oh yeah has me doing, and it's and it's great. It's like you're sitting there for 45 seconds, and you're like, oh, this is easy, and then you're at like a minute and a half, and you're like, I've got this, <laughs> and then suddenly it's like you're looking at every second on the clock. Yeah, <laughs> and it's it's all a mental game of like how yeah. much over two minutes can I just sit up against this wall as things are burning. Yeah, I have learned to to love it. I guess I hate. I mean, I hate it, and yet I love it. So, yeah. so we can get into the physical stuff, but but most interesting to me because I think it's it's the hardest to articulate. Uh huh. It's the thing that hurts us the most, and it's the area that I'm personally most interested in. Is this idea of discomfort? Just dis, you know. Discomfortable? Discomfortable? What's the word? Uncomfortable? <laughs> Uncomfortable, we would normally say, yeah. Okay. <laughs> A place without comfort. Yes. The, the discomfort within uh, reality. Yeah. This is where you start your book and this is where you kind of start, but it is the thing that, that I, again, I struggle to articulate because why yeah. would we rather put up with fake fictitious things that we're comfortable with than face yeah. the truth. The truth is amazing, as uncomfortable as it may be, but but it's, it's a bit of a mind f- Do you know what I mean? Yeah, well, it's that old saying, you know, better the devil you don't, you know, than the devil you don't. And it's that exactly. Like you might not like the circumstances that you're in, but you know them. Yeah. It's almost like you've got comfortable living in, in this world with the discomfort that you have. Again, you're living with discomfort, not hunting it. And there is this um, disconnect between how we see the world and how the world really is. And I would say, if you don't have the results that you want in, in life and in business is anything, and I'm talking about money, success, however you want to define it, and even more joy and happiness, what's missing is not some action you need to take. What's missing is that you have an underlying belief about yourself, others, or the world that's holding you back from achieving whatever it is that you want to achieve. And when you get to the source of that belief and shift it, all of a sudden new results come. It's the result of seeing the world, seeing yourself in a different way. And all of a sudden new actions are just automatic. New results are automatic. They're the result of changing how you see the world. But to do so, you have to accept that the, the way you see the world isn't necessarily truth. It's not, it's not locked in. It's not fact. It's not reality. It's, it's through not your even lens. close. It's through I, your stories. It's through your history. It's through how you process everything. And once, once you realize that you can open up into a new world, it's incredibly yeah. freeing or you start to pull on the thread of, well, okay, let's say I grew up in the church. Yeah. Well, but what if, what, what, what if this foundation, this bedrock that I grew up in, what I start to question and yeah. what if my beliefs in, in science or my understanding of money and wealth, or, yeah. you know, there are these foundational elements. And once you start to pull on the thread, uh, I've gone through this in the last few years myself, I started to question and I, and I continue to question everything. And then once you do yeah, it's freeing, 
for sure you can you can start to pick your own path and have growth, but you feel like you lose the foundation yeah. that you're so comfortable living in. Right. The, it, that's that's exactly it. I mean, the more axiomatic the belief is, the closer it is to who you believe you are and the things that you hold true, the more disorienting it's going to be. But ultimately, the more freeing it's going to be at the same time once you're willing to go through and, and let it go. Um, and it, it really is that surrender component of saying, hey, everything that I believe to be true, and it, it feels a little bit like death, everything that I believe to be true about myself, the world, the other people that I have, I'm going to let go of those things and let new potential arise is really hard. Yeah. You know, there, there's that idea of the phoenix rising from the ashes, right? And I, I can't tell you how many people and businesses I've uh, heard be like, ah, oh, I'm like the phoenix rising from the ashes. But what most of them mean is that I'm just going to keep going. They forgot the most important part, which is the burning. The burning, the views, the ethics, the beliefs that weren't working for you. And when you burn those things, those parts of yourself that aren't working, again, you see the world in a new way. And that's the true Phoenix rising. It's new potential, greater than you could ever even imagine from where you sit today. And I know for myself, when I face this, and I'll, I'll be really honest and specific about this. Like, you know, I, uh, my wife and I became Christian yeah. in our, in our early twenties. Uh, all of our kids are named with Christian names, Yeah, you know, right out of the Bible. We were really, really active in the church. Yeah. And then about two years ago, all of that, all of that doubt and all of that stuff that I was suppressing and all of that, well, I'm not sure. And all of the little red mm. flags and all of the skepticism, I just, I always used faith is believing in what cannot be proven. Yeah. And then that's the that, ultimate like, faith. But that that will power for me kind of ran out <laughs> mm-hmm. because I still wasn't getting answers and okay and I'm not and so over the you know I've deconstructed my faith mm. which is incredibly unnerving. I bet. Um, it's hard from a community point of view, it's hard from a friend point of view, it's hard for me to be the leader of my household and my home and and a husband and 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 parent yeah. my kids when when I'm when I'm doing this. And I've accepted all of these new principles that are that are almost based more in 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 a Zen kind of environment, not necessarily mm-hmm. fully Buddhist, but but much more Zen. And I see how there's some overlap. Yeah. But I've had conversations with my wife where where I go, if I'm not this, what am I? Mm. I I I don't know. Like I I don't have a religion. I don't yeah. have a culture. I don't have a community. I don't. What, what am I? Like, what do I tell people? What do I tell myself? Oh, I, what do I believe? Wow. And, and like, I'm, I'm, I'm really uncomfortable. Even sharing yeah, this right that now, gave me goosebumps, by the way. I don't have answers yet. Yeah. And my pastor texted me the other day to say, Hey, let's grab coffee. Cause we agreed to kind of grab coffee and talk yeah. about, and I'm thinking of, I, I, I don't know, other than I've deconstructed and haven't reconstructed, but I don't know. I guess what I'm looking for reassurance, I, I'm happy I've done this. I'm happy I'm doing it. And I know deep down in my heart on the other side, whenever this is a year, two years, 10 years, whatever it is, mm. I will be a stronger person for having faced this and worked through it. No question. But I mean, it's, it's incredibly uncomfortable. So what do we tell it, our audience? What, do you, what advice do you have for me, for people like me who who may not even be midway through this, but they're like, <laughs> you know, you're reprogramming, yeah. you're reprogramming on your own here. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think what humans tend to do is we grab onto knowledge to make us feel safe, right? Knowledge about this is how the world works. This is who I am. This is who my family is. And it makes us feel comfortable. Like, ah, I know who I am. And we do that because all of us face the ultimate unknown in every single second. You know, as much as we're um, covered by news predictions and stock predictions, and here's what's going to happen tomorrow on the news, we actually, at a fundamental level, don't know what's happening tomorrow at all. And it's not promised to us at any level. And I think when we're uh, young kids, I'm seeing it. My nieces now they're five, three and one. And the older one is at this point with like, something's not okay. Right. Like I'm starting to realize that the world isn't just this fun, joyful place where I eat and sleep and can color, but 
like it's, it's a little bit darker. There's some darker elements to it. And what you're doing, I give you a lot of credit for it. You know, you can do it with religion. You can do it with your identity. You can do it with work is you're starting to get to the point of letting go of who you thought you were, who you believe that you were. And I can give you an answer to who you are, which is just from this point, infinite potential. It's you get to choose, but until you come to terms with the fact that tomorrow is unknown, it's really hard to declare something in that space of nothingness until you accept it. So, and it, and it does take time. You know, some people, uh, it could take months, it could take years. In, in some cases, it could take decades. But what you're doing is you're facing the ultimate unknown. And once you can stand there, you can declare anything for yourself. You mentioned some areas we could do this, but yeah, should we not, like, is it not worth doing it in all areas? You know, our relationship with, Again, I keep coming back to the ones that matter to me. Um, sure, yeah. Health, uh, money, family. I'm a father and a husband. So what does that mean to me? Yeah. The other day I was talking to my coach where I, I've realized that I've always wanted to be an athlete. Like that's not always, <laughs> but like my the last few years, I'm like, I want to be an athlete. I not think athletic. you are, man. So this is the thing. People keep telling me that I am and I go, but I don't feel like one. And then I realized I've never defined what that even means. Like, like yeah. I keep saying like, I want to be an athlete. I'm not an athlete, but I've never sat yeah. down to say like, well, what would I have to do to be an athlete? Like, what, what yeah. would that mean? What would that have to be? And yeah. so what are the areas of our lives that we should be calling into question? Well, I, w- I would say you call into the questions, the beliefs in the areas of your life that aren't working or aren't working as well as you'd like them to. So if you're happy in your relationships, you're happy with your money, but you're unhappy with a particular relationship or you're hunting happy in your job, well, start there. But like do I, even, I would, but do, do, does one even realize that there, that, that there's something maybe better or that you're unhappy? Well, that's the thing. I think so many people get into justifying placating why they are the way they are. Like, ah, I'm a bit of a curmudgeon and I don't really like to get up in the morning because that's just my personality. Well, true that now it is, but it doesn't have to be that way. That's just how your personality wound up. Ah. Like you, you ended up with that personality. You didn't choose it or ah, I make this much money or I'm starting a business. So I have to, you know, take less money the first couple of years. Well, who said you and why? And I think most of our lives are spent not actually achieving our potential, but making up for some belief, usually a really core axiomatic belief that we decided about ourselves when we were young. And th- that's the real power in that. You keep saying axiomatic. I- I've, not, I've never even Sorry. heard that term. What does that mean? Axiomatic means like the, the closer to your foundation, ah. uh, like the uh, things that you would unquestionably see as true. And it's oftentimes the things you're not even thinking about. You know, for people that maybe grow up in the church, it's like, ah, there is a God and it works like this. And here's the book. And this is how it says. And I don't question that at all. Or my personality is I'm scared to speak in public, which was me, by the way. Mm-hmm. Right. I that, that just is my personality. And to go after that discomfort is very disorienting because it's close to how I define myself. Like, I believe I'm a person that is scared to speak in public. And to let go of that belief is like, it kind of leaves you spinning because like you said, if you're not that, what are you? Yeah. And it brings you again, face to face with that unknown. Like, well, what am I? I'm what I declare myself to be. How have you figured this out for yourself? (laughs) I don't don't think it's something that you figure out. I think it's something that you um, develop over time. You know, a lot of my coaches would call it a, a mountain with no top. Right. Yeah. You just continue to climb. And so, no, yeah, I've the, made the a reason I ask is, progress. Is, yeah. is because, yes, if I'm not this, then I can be I can be anything. Yeah. But if my anything is unlimited potential. Yeah. <laughs> where, where do we set yeah. the targets? Well, How do we well, define the targets? How do we even know? I mean, like, again, I'm yeah. each each question unravels another layer of potential questions that unravels yeah. another layer. Or maybe I'm overthinking this. Well, I think there is a base layer, which is you're basically staring into Plato's abyss, right? You're staring into the nothingness that is tomorrow. And unless you're standing there, anything that you choose to be or say you're declaring yourself to be will not be strong enough 
to overcome the massive amount of uncertainty and discomforts in the world. But when you get down to be able to stare into that unknown and be like, yeah, I might not be here tomorrow. All these things that I love about myself, I love about my family and I love about my world are not guaranteed to me. That's an incredibly powerful place to choose what you want your life to be about. And to your point, you do have to choose, Hmm. right? If you just live in this space of I can be anything, it's true, but ultimately you will be nothing when our time runs out. And when you choose, you develop yourself in a certain way to, you know, like you said, to be an athlete or to be a successful entrepreneur or whatever it is that you want to be. But if you're doing those things from a place that's not grounded in really the humility and gratitude of looking at tomorrow, saying it's not promised to me, it just won't last. I almost need a moment. They're going to, they're going to cut out that pause. (laughs) You can leave it. If you like, like it is, it is really heavy stuff. I mean, we're talking about some of the stuff in jest, but you know, ultimately the question for me is, you know, Sterling, what do you want your life to be about? Like I've been through some high highs and some low lows, you know, the first company that I started sold to a group in Silicon Valley and it had this multi-billion dollar valuation, like living the dream life right? Flying private, tons of money, models in the office, parties at the Four Seasons. And long story short, housing market collapsed 2008, 2010-ish, and the whole thing goes bankrupt. Half a billion dollars of investments gone. And I just, I hit the wall. I started playing out kind of a sad country song of not only did I not have a job, eventually I ran out of cash. I move into my parents' house. Uh, my girlfriend even broke up with me. It's like I'm hitting every single beat of this thing, right? And it's in those darker moments. Um, you might even say in some of that suffering that you come to terms with what is, what is about yourself? What is the world? What do you want it to be? And, you know, again, you get into that real place of, humility. And I start to say, okay, you know, if tomorrow's not guaranteed, what really matters to me in the end, right? When I get to my deathbed, what do I want my life to be about? And it's, it's a very deep, very profound journey. But I think if you're living a life, not asking some of those questions, I I think, again, it was Plato that said it, it's not a life worth living, or it's maybe better said, it's a life that you're going to regret at the end. And and so what does it look like? Each person is different, but what does it look mm. like to hunt discomfort? Uh, how is discomfort almost like a barometer for areas that we should actually dig a little deeper? <laughs> yeah, well, it, you know, I, I think there's this, you could all call it a cultural norm that people don't want to be uncomfortable, right? Like, I don't want you to call me I this don't. name. I or... mean, I, no, nobody. <laughs> <laughs> Not for you, but for many, they're like, you know, I don't want to be uncomfortable in, in these situations. And it, it's true. I, I don't think like people should be forcing other people to be uncomfortable. I think it's something that you have to choose. But there's this kind of general consensus that discomfort's maybe not such a great thing amongst many. Probably none of the people listening to this podcast, by the way. So I give them a lot of credit already. And if we're looking at the world that way, where we're shying away from discomfort, however you want to define that, right? It could be embarrassment, could be pain, could be sadness, discomfort in the broadest sense. Not only are we denying part of ourselves, but we're denying our ability to see the world more clearly. I found this great story from, uh, it was the 1870s. This guy, his name was uh, G.A. Hansen. And he started studying of all things leprosy. And leprosy, I think most people are familiar with terrible disease where, you know, you you lose body parts and your skin deteriorates. And that's just what people thought leprosy was. And this guy starts looking at it and he goes, wait a minute. That's not what leprosy does. What leprosy does is it's a bacteria that numbs your ability to feel pain. And then what happens is, you know, people bump their arm or they get a scratch. It doesn't feel painful. It gets infected. And then all of a sudden, these terrible things happen with like their limbs falling off. And that's true. Like we're talking about that University of Michigan study. Discomfort is the same, however you're handling it. And if you're denying it, pushing away or or have um, something in you that says, hey, I I don't want to go there. 
you're disconnecting yourself from the impact you're going to be able to make and how you're interacting with the world. I feel like I talk myself in circles there a little bit. Did that make sense though? No, it, 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 it hundred percent does. And okay. I use it as a barometer. So like I was sharing earlier about, yeah. about my deconstruction with Christianity. Yeah. Boy, did that make me uncomfortable. So I was like, oh, I should probably say it. I bet. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, last week I went for a walk and I, I was trying to figure out some of my uh, really, I, I didn't realize I was getting into some of my really deep seated fears. Yeah. And as I'm writing them down, I'm writing myself notes on my phone. I'm getting really, really uncomfortable, like just mm. writing it down. And so mm. I was like, oh, there must be something to this. Yeah. And then I'm sharing these things with my wife and I didn't, I couldn't even say them out loud. So I kind of handed her the phone a few days later and I was like, I, I haven't yeah. talked to you about this, but here you go. And she's like, oh, that's really interesting. Like, like deep fears yeah. in my childhood about abandonment and all this mm -hmm. stuff. So, yeah. so sometimes I see it. Yeah. Sometimes I go like, okay, this, this is my body. This is my physical reaction. Something is making me very uncomfortable. Yeah. So I got to do it. <laughs> exactly. But, and I get excited about those things. I get excited about cold showers that I take and yeah. going to Spartan and doing runs <laughs> and doing these physical activities. Cause it yeah. makes me feel like a superhuman and awesome. It's, um, it's the actual really subtle things that you can let slide that I feel like yeah. actually erodes, uh, for, at least for people like me, erodes uh, uh, our success, our consistency. Um, yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, and I, I think that's very true. Like, well, discomfort as a human experience, I would say from like a evolutionary standpoint is designed to keep you safe. Many of our, let's call it discomfort mechanisms are misaligned right? We're feeling really deep fears and things that threaten our um, whole existence from things like sharing a sentence of words. Yeah. Right? Like in the scheme of your life, nobody's going to get a gun to the head. You're not going to, you know, pass away in that moment, but it feels that way. Yeah. I felt and, that way about, about a LinkedIn post I put up this morning yeah. <laughs> that my team sent me. They pulled a clip from me on a podcast and I was like, oh, like, oh, gosh, I, I don't think I can share this. <laughs> I said oh, that. I, uh, you know, for, on their channel, that's cool. But I'm, I'm going to show this to my friends, right. really? <laughs> yeah. Right. It's so silly. It, it is. And as you go into that discomfort, you start to better calibrate your view of the world, your view of yourself. Uh, now, to be said, discomfort is different than danger. And that's an important thing to point out and for everybody to understand. Right. Again, when I was going skydiving, I felt like I was going to die. But you saw the parachute. <laughs> exactly. But the reality is that my likelihood of dying was much greater by simply driving to the place where we were going to do it by getting stung by a bee, by all these countless things that could have happened, kind of like lightning strike events, right? Then it was jumping out of that plane. And by going into that discomfort, understanding those ratios, understanding what actually is dangerous versus what's really just uncomfortable, you better calibrate yourself to operate in the world. And the better you get, at calibrating your discomfort to what actually is the bigger impact you'll make and the better results you'll have every single time. Now, this might just be a total bullshit excuse question, but I have to imagine yeah. Yeah. that people are saying, well, I I'm even thinking this. Well, each level of new discomfort becomes comfortable. So you seek out more discomfort, which becomes comfortable. So you seek out more discomfort, which becomes comfortable. And yeah. do, you, do you just not find yourself becoming uh some kind of adrenaline junkie or something and and I, again i know that's bullshit but for some reason in the back of my mind i'm thinking my skeptical side's thinking that yeah i actually get that a lot because you know i've done some crazy things in my day um and they're like sterling you must be an adrenaline junkie and i'm like i'm yeah, you, not you like swum with swum swum swam? <laughs> i'm off today you, you swam <laughs> with sharks yes yeah. swam with sharks you know I've, I've ridden my uh bike across the rocky mountains i've trekked through the sahara like i've done some really cool things and people are like oh you, you know you're just one of those adrenaline junkie people and i'm like i'm not you know if i'm really honest with you and myself is i'm scared to do most of those things are you yeah what do you tell yourself when, what do you, what do you say to yourself in your head 
once you're facing those scary things? Because anyone looking at your story would never accuse you of being scared of those things. Well, I, I look at two things. First is, is this actually dangerous, right? Like what's the real danger that I'm facing here? And oftentimes it's like next to nothing. <laughs> And then the second thing that I do is I say, I'm going to do it no matter what. That's what no matter what's about, right? I commit in a way where there's no going back. And I use uh, my audience. I use friends and family. Like I will tell people things to hold me accountable because it's just all too easy to shrink back and be like, "Eh, I don't really want to do that shark dive. I just thought it was going to be cool. But when you're on the line for something, it calls you into that discomfort And when you're in that discomfort, it's the opportunity, again, to surrender to it and grow from it. How has this made you um, a stronger man, uh, a smarter business person, uh, uh, a better friend? Like, how has this made you and shaped you to become a better version of yourself? Well, I I think it's just oriented me um, to a place where I can see myself, others in the world in a more effective way. Not like it's the right way but a more effective way to make the difference that we're looking at making. And I think, you know, for as much as I've gotten out of it, which is far cooler for me, and I think even more inspiring are some of the people that are in what we call the no matter what community, you know, people that are committed to really big goals, dreams, you might even say outlandish things, like the things that you might be a little bit shy to tell somebody, but in your heart, that's what you really want. They're doing those things and they're committed to going through the discomfort to achieve them. I'll I'll give you a story. Um, A friend of mine, she's in the no matter what community. Her name's Sarah. She felt like she was uh, pretty stalled out. I think it was only about a year and a half ago. She'd been in her job for a decade. They weren't really paying her much more. She was kind of in this place where she's not sure if she wants to move states or what she wants to do with her life. And we do these events within the community. This one was uh, to do uh, what's called the triple bypass. Have you heard of this before? I've not. So it's through three mountain passes in the Rockies. It's a 107 mile road bike ride goes through about 10,000 feet of elevation gain, supposedly one of the hardest uh, road bike rides in the country, if not the world. And you know, I'm crazy enough. I'm like, okay, I'm going to sign up for that. <laughs> I've just moved to Colorado. Why not do that? You know, why not? Of course. And I invited some people to go with me. And she's one of the people that said, you know what? I'm going to do this hard thing. Now she didn't have a bicycle at the time. Yep. She, she had never really written, you know, she knew how to ride a bicycle, but she wasn't an avid rider to any extent, but she's like, I'm going to do this hard thing. And I give her a lot of credit. You know, we brought in a trainer. Uh, she did all the training. Eventually she did get a, a road bike and she did all 107 miles. She kept up with me the entire time. I, I couldn't believe it. And what happened for her is doing something really hard like that shakes up how you see yourself. It kind of shakes up the status quo that you're in. And within months, she moved to a new state. She got a new job that's paying her more than she was ever being paid before with a lot of room to grow. And she's happier than ever. And it's like, well, wait a minute. That works every time. When you go do the hard thing, you shake up whatever status quo you might be in, something better comes out the other side. It just might not feel good on the way. Yeah. And so with, with myself, you mentioned early on, yeah. uh, maybe it was even off the call about, about my Instagram. You know, you've seen my Instagram. Yeah. A year ago at this time, I was doing something called the Chunk Tong Challenge, which is one of the hardest things I've ever done. Yeah. From a physical point of view, from an eating point of view, from a diet point of view. Yeah. I think I, got, I saw that post, by the way. <laughs> I got crazy good results and yeah. I made myself really proud. And, yeah. and then outside of this challenge and the framework of being, I mean, my, my wife and kids hated every minute of it. It, 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 like just the four months that it became, they did not like it. They hated it. Uh, my, yeah. my mom was like, you're too thin and too skinny and it's unhealthy. And, um, I'm proud. I'm, I'm making myself proud. Yeah. But it just cost so much. Um, it just cost emotionally so much. Yeah. So out of the framework of doing that challenge with my nutritionist, with my coach, with everything else, it's been like this slow decline. Like I said, I'm already yeah. 15 pounds heavier than I want to be for Spartan. It's been this slow decline away from those results. And sometimes I look back at those results and I go, I did, I did that. Like I was, yeah. I, I can't even, I guess I, yeah, I did that. And, and it doesn't make me proud anymore. It's now this gap of like, I did it. And that made me proud. Yeah. But it's been now so long since I did that. 
that I'm now kind of ashamed that I don't seem to be able to just replicate the magic. Yeah. Well, let me ask you, why did you do that to begin with? I have never been up until that point. I was never, I never felt attractive. I have always kind of struggled with self-confidence Yeah. and I've never been comfortable in my body. So getting down and getting lean and being like a size medium and then a size small, when if you go back four years, I was like going into size 40 pants. I was a double extra large. I was 70 pounds heavier than I was kind of at my leanest. Wow. Probably about, probably about 45, 50 pounds heavier than I am now. Zero yeah. muscle mass, never lift, lifted or anything like that. And I wanted to do something... <laughs> I, I wanted to do something really audacious and big yeah. and hard. And it like the story that you told from your community of going and doing this, this cycling thing changed everything. Yeah. It gave me the, the, the courage and I felt bold enough to say, if I could do this, I can make huge changes to my business. I can make big yeah. changes to my life. I can, during COVID, I can come out of COVID lockdowns fitter and stronger and more attractive and healthier than I went into it. Like it just made me yeah. feel like a rock star. Yeah. And then since then, again, this gap of like, well, I guess that was cool. <laughs> but but now I actually feel worse about myself I think than before. Yeah. Well, I, I'll tell you what, I, I say this with, with a lot of love. Yeah. Right? No, it, it, it's it. an incredible achievement. I think for anybody to do anything like that or like what Sarah did, like it's huge and it's necessary to get yourself um, shaken up a little bit. But when you're doing it from a place of compensation, it's not sustainable. Like underneath your decision to do that was a faulty belief. You were viewing reality about yourself, I would say in an incorrect or maybe not even incorrect, but ineffective way. Which is why now I've returned I guess right, back, right? Because right. Like, like your I conversation. I wasn't able to reprogram it. It was this vacation right. and now I'm back to whatever right. up here. It, yeah. it, it was a fighting against something like I'm not good enough or I'm not fit enough, right? That's my belief. And I'm going to use these external circumstances, which get, getting really fit is, right? I'm going to eat this. I'm going to do this gym. I'm going to fight this fight every day. And it feels like fighting, doesn't it? <laughs> it right? does. You got to <laughs> ask your family. They're like, man, he was <laughs> gritting his teeth every day. Right. When you're fighting against a faulty belief, it is never sustainable. That's why so many people go on these uh, diets or do really fit things and then they regress. It's because they're compensating for a faulty belief. And when you get into what that belief actually is and frankly surrender to it, you're free from it. And it's only once you're free from that belief that you can achieve your greatest potential. Okay. So, wow, this is, <laughs> this is, this is something because even at the time when I was at my fittest and I got down to 13% body fat or something, um, nice. towards the end. And I was, I was pretty proud. My coach yeah. a few weeks later said, are you proud of the results? And I said, no, he right. said, why not? And I said, I, I still didn't look the way I wanted. So, um, I, I, it, And it was this unachievable, un, I, like, it's not even reality what I thought that I wanted, but I would also tell people like, in my heart, I'm still just a fat guy, right? Like I, I would say like, yeah. like, like I've uh, cool, I've gotten fit and people would say, you hey, look so good. And you're so fit. And I wouldn't accept the compliments because it's just still, still feel like the same old Mark. So. Yeah. And I, and I will tell you for anybody that's dealt with that or anything parallel, no matter what you do, it will never be good enough. There is nothing outside of you that's going to satiate that feeling of never being good enough. So how do and I surrender to this then? Well, I, I think you've, you've done uh, a, a really good start, right? Because I think it's only through doing hard things that you even get glimpses at that. And you're like, hey, what am I fighting against? And what are some of those core beliefs? Again, axiomatic beliefs, core beliefs, you could put those in about the same bucket, right? What are those things about me? And then how do I get to the essence of that? And I would say, um, we wouldn't go through the exercise now, but it's starting to look at where is that feeling in your body, right? Like if I have to look at not accepting that compliment, where am I rejecting that inside of me? And not from a memory standpoint, but from more of a feeling standpoint, when is the first time that I could recall that I felt that way? Was it 10 years ago, 20 years ago? Was it when you were five years old? I don't know, but it's probably fairly young. 
And it's digging into that early situation in your life where you decided that I wasn't good enough that you can change it from. If you're not changing it from the root, it's, you know, like we've been saying, unsustainable. Does that help a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Now, the discomfort itself, yeah, you've got to the, get to the root of it. You've got to uproot it. You've got to kind of start to shift what those underlying beliefs are. But I don't think that's enough. Uh, I came across some work by Paul Tillich. He's a German-American theologian and philosopher. And he has uh, two types of concerns that he says that humans possess. We have finite concerns like, ah, I need a roof over my head. I need this much money. I want to grow my business by this amount. I want to weigh this much. And we all have those concerns. We have to deal with them, right? But when we attach ourselves to those things, we can get lost because why? The world's uncertain. Things don't always go the way that we plan. There's pandemics that happen and wars in Europe that take place, right? The world is inherently unpredictable. And he says, well, there's this other type of human concern, a more important fundamental concern that we all have that we oftentimes don't pay much attention to. And he calls it your ultimate concern. Things like love, joy, happiness, things that no matter what happens in the world, they can't be taken away from us. And when we shift out of those finite concerns and into the ultimate concerns, it frees us from the day to day. And it, uh, I think, like we're saying, unrooted some of that discomfort, you replace it with that ultimate concern, whatever that might be for you. You've, you've triggered a memory uh, that I have. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Tony Robbins. And a yeah. few years ago, I went to Unleash the Power Within. And when he was speaking about the uh, the six values that, mm. that he believes everyone has, and, and I've yeah. really grabbed onto it. And, you know, they be, we all fall into a certain camp, but there's certainty. People just are addicted to certainty. There's variety. You know, he says, if everybody had to eat the exact same sandwich every single day for 10 years, they would want varieties of spice of life. So no some question. people are really drawn to certainty. Some people are really drawn to variety. Some people are drawn to connection. Some people are drawn to significance. And then yeah. he has two others, contribution and growth, which are kind of, he calls the values of the soul. Hmm. But you reminded me of is specifically when he's in the States, and I think yeah. it changes from culture to culture. But when he's in the States and he asks the stadium of 14 or 15,000 people to raise their hands for which value they find themselves currently drawn to most, something like 50 or 60% raise their hands for certainty. I know, yeah. I know I did. That, that was yeah. certainty and significance. Yeah. The things that it's like, I want to be really significant and I want to feel important. Yeah. I want recognition. But I don't really want to risk anything. <laughs> <laughs> and so as you can right. to say time after time, how uncertain the future is, how uncertain our control over things are, how uncertain it is, how can yeah. we get more comfortable with uncertainty? How can we hunt discomfort when it yeah. comes to all of the unpredictability that exists? Yeah. Well, I, I would draw again on uh, some of the things that Paul Tillage says, you know, and if you look, I, I think moments are important, right? Like we live lives, but it's the moments that really stand out to us. And if we look for a moment where we were really inspired, you know, if you've got a moment for yourself back through your life, could be recently, could be a long time ago. Like when were you really authentically moved and inspired? And how would you characterize that moment, right? Was it, is it love? Is it joy? Is it affinity? Is it gratitude? Like, what is that human experience for you? And label it. Not so much that the label matters. It's the human experience in that moment that matters. And as you can bring that experience, call on that experience, cultivate that experience in the hardest of times, it starts to alleviate it, right? If you bring joy like a real experience of joy, not the idea of joy, but an experience of joy into some uncertainty about your business, what happens? Or if you bring gratitude, real experience of gratitude into a tough relationship or a tough conversation with your significant other, what happens, right? And that's how you start to uh, hunt that discomfort by alchemizing the ultimate concern, the love, the joy, the gratitude, with the specific discomforts that you have. Does that make sense? 
it's it's the it's the carrot, you know. Yeah. Um, a lot of people struggle with money, and they struggle yeah. with, especially entrepreneurs, with with charging enough. Uh, yeah. They're, they're for some reason they're comfortable like being the lowest paid in the company or never hitting their goals or never hitting the wealth levels that they want to hit. Yeah. Or they're and not yet, comfortable with it. They're just living with it. They're they're just, right. They're just putting up with it. Yeah. And and yet if you really break down your your value system or your relationship or your understanding of money, uh, most of the time it, it just comes back to to the self worth. I want to be enough. And, and exactly. And so, yeah. uh, you know, putting yourself out there and <laughs> charging <laughs> what, what you think you're worth yeah. calls into question, well, what if they say no? What if yeah. they think they're not good enough? What yeah. if I go down the path and they're disappointed? Yeah. What if, what if, what if, what if, what if? And so we just, we don't want to put ourselves on that ledge. We don't want to risk it. We don't want to make it happen. And instead, we just kind of settle for the results that we have. Right. Yeah. It, and it takes a lot to do that because just putting it out there like, oh, I'm going to charge X thousands of dollars for a uh, speaking engagement. Well, if you don't actually believe that you're worth that much, my bet is that that's probably not going to work, at least over time. But if you can shift that underlying belief of who you are, what you're doing and how much it's worth, I guarantee you it'll work. The, the hard part is changing that underlying belief. Is there a simple way we could do that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we've we've really been talking about. I know, it, right? we've talked we've talked about it. In yeah, so but pieces. let's can, let's can use you give that. me like here are the five ways to do. It. <laughs> let's let's use that as an example, and and yeah, we'll we'll walk right through the five steps in the book. Okay, so yeah. my discomfort that I'm feeling is I don't like being on the phone asking for money. Okay, yeah. you found your discomfort. That's step one, right? Your view about what that means to you is just fundamentally flawed. That's why you're uncomfortable doing it. Okay. Step two is what I would call get a tattoo. Commit so deeply, there's no going back. So you kind of hold your feet to the fire and say, you know what? I'm going to make 10 calls a day. And in every one of those calls, I'm going to ask for money. And after each one of them, if you really want to get into it, what you're going to start looking at yourself like, what did I make that mean? Like, what's the core belief? What's the experience that maybe from my childhood that I can recall that I'm fighting against? Because the more you find it, like you get a better opportunity to see it for what it really is. And this is going to be very, very uncomfortable for you. If you're like many, you're going to do this for two or three days and then be like, eh, I'm out. That's where the third step comes in, which I call build a street gang. Surround yourself with people that are going to do many things for you. But most importantly, in this example, is they're going to hold you accountable. They're going to make sure that every day you're making these phone calls. The fourth step is somewhat applicable here. I, I call it flip it, right? How can you use your uh, challenges to your advantage? So it might be saying on some of these phone calls, like, hey, frankly, I'm really scared to ask you for money. But I'm committed to growing this business and I'm committed that you grow your business. So if you're going to work with me, I'm going to show you how to do this exact same thing, right? Like take those um, things about yourself that you're uncertain of, you're scared of, you don't want to bring out into the world and bring those things out into the world <laughs> very purposefully. Own it. <laughs> right. There's, there's strength there. I can tell you a story about somebody after. Uh, there's strength there if you take the time to find it. And then the fifth step, as you're doing this for days, weeks, maybe even months, you practice surrendering. You practice letting go. And you might do that by journaling, walking in the woods, listening to music, right? You let go of the significance around what making that phone call means and why you're not good enough to do it and ask for it in the first place. And if you do that over and over and over again, you use the system not as like, one and done, but this is a way that I'm living my life, you will create this virtuous spiral where you start to get more and more of the results that you want. And some of those people that you're calling in our example here are going to say yes. And yeah. that's where it starts. Yeah. I, I love that. I love that. And especially if, as you just said in the previous point, if you can tie it to gratitude, if you can tie it to service, if you can tie it as a gift, Yeah. Um, you know, specifically with money, who is counting on me? Yeah. Who fails if I don't succeed? Who, you know, is looking to me to make sure that I do what I need to do 
yeah. so that way they can do what they need to do. And this is my, this is my wife. This is my kids. This is my team. This yeah. is all of these people. You know, I had a friend about a year ago say something that I didn't even realize. You know, we were working together on a team on a, on a project. Yeah, he has a very very large team, and it's it was kind of this side project. Yeah, and so when I got busy, I just kind of ignored it. And he reached out one day and he's like, I need you to do what you committed to doing yeah. because I have people whose livelihoods and careers depend on you doing your thing. Yeah. This might be a side project for you, but this is their livelihood. Yeah, that's right. And it was like, whew. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> Right, right, right. I forgot that I have to take this as seriously as everyone else is sometimes. Um, and so some of these areas of gratitude, some of these areas of who's counting on me, whatever it is, how do you play? Because I, I do this. I look yeah. at my disc profile or my Myers-Briggs or I look at all these things and I think, okay, what is it? What is the thing that I can leverage to get me to do the things I don't want to do? I'm motivated by recognition and yeah. I'm motivated by change. So now I start to go, how can I reverse engineer recognition into this? So that way I'll do it. <laughs> like, like I'll do it just so I'll be recognized. You, you do kind of trap yourself into it. I, I think that's, that's hugely useful. And at the same time, um, I think motivation can be short-lived. I think about motivation as um, forcing yourself or somebody else forcing you to do something you don't really want to do. Yeah. And it, it works. There's totally a place for it. it it's just unsustainable. You know, it's like we were saying before, like you're fighting you. about against something. And if you're fighting against something, you're never going to be able to surpass it. It's like a glass ceiling. Um, so instead of just motivation, I look to a place of inspiration, like what authentically comes from you. And it's probably something like love, joy, gratitude. Those things are at the center of us, even if we often don't feel them. Um, and as we're coming from that place, we're literally unstoppable. Like if you're coming from a place of gratitude all the time, or maybe even better, just the difficult times, difficult situations, you're going to get past them much faster, much more efficiently, and really better than you would otherwise, because you're no longer fighting against something. You're unleashing something that's very true to yourself. Last thing, and I so appreciate yeah. all of all of this. Just, just yeah, this is a blast, you, by the way. We could probably be doing this for another two hours. <laughs> Although with your guest, you probably could do that with everybody. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. But I, I, a last story I would love for you to dive into and share if you can. Share with everyone in the audience, please, about the pike and why we shouldn't be like the pike, because that was really cool. It's, I read this from a friend of mine, his name's Josh Linkner, and he was telling me about this. And I did some research on it, and I'm like, unbelievable. So the story goes back, I think it originated in the 1800s, but the study has been replicated many times, is they took a fight, a pike, which is a famously carnivorous fish, right? It eats smaller fish, and they put the pike in a tank, with the feeder fish that it would eat, but they put a piece of glass between it and the fish. And the pike being a pike just kept bumping into that glass, just thinking it was going to get that feeder fish and going to get it this time. I'm going to try again. And it, it just beats its nose until it can't take it anymore. And it kind of settles down to the bottom of the tank. Now, what everybody thought, what I thought as I was reading this case study is that, oh, you take out the glass then the pike's going to go start eating the fish again. But that's not what happened, right? The, the pike's view of the world stayed that way because it kept hitting that discomfort. It kept hitting that glass. So when the glass was removed and the fish were literally swimming right across its nose, it wouldn't eat them. It's kind of a sad story. Every pike that's been through this experiment actually ends up perishing. They stop eating. It's called pike syndrome. And I think many of us live out lives this way, even though unconsciously, like, ah, I've tried this six, seven, eight times. I must not be worthy of that. I can't do that. I, my personality isn't suited to that. And that may have been true when you made those decisions, but that doesn't mean that it's still true. And the pike, you could make the case that if it was a person would kind of say things about itself, like, oh, I'm not good enough. I don't want to do this. Uh, I'm uh, not worthy of continuing going forward. I'm just going to give up. And then you see these people in the workplace that have resigned their lives to this just is the way it is. This is just the way that I am. But the good news is that we're not all pike. 
and we can change some of those beliefs. And, you know, it's been core central to this whole conversation. As you change some of those underlying beliefs, it unleashes all sorts of results. It would have for the Pike if they could figure it out, if we could talk to them, and it would definitely for us. 